We've learned what a density curve is. We're going to think of a density curve as a smooth relative frequency histogram. Since a relative frequency histogram describes a distribution, the heights of the bars should add to 1. Similarly, in a density curve, since it's a smooth relative frequency histogram, the area under the curve should still be 1. A special density curve is called the normal distribution. That's just one example of a special density curve. The normal distribution is symmetric around its mean mu and has a standard deviation sigma. We're going to use the 68, 95, 99.7% rule for the normal distribution to compute probabilities associated with variables that have a normal distribution. From this graphic, you can see an illustration of the 68, 95, 99.7% rule. It says that 68% of the data lie in this area right here within one standard deviation above or one standard deviation below the mean. 95% of the observations fall within two standard deviations of the mean. That is, 95% of the time, your observations are going to be between these two values. And the area under the curve within plus 2 and minus 2 standard deviations is 95%, or 0.95. And within three standard deviations, 99.7% of the data is found within three standard deviations of the mean. Now you can sort of understand what a standard deviation is a little bit better. It gives us a guideline, kind of a yardstick, for where we can expect most of our observations to lie. How are we going to use the 6895 99.7% rule, or the empirical rule, to compute probabilities? We're always going to start each question that asks about the normal distribution by labeling our normal curve in the following way. Since 68% of the observations are within one standard deviation of the mean, then since this curve is symmetric, that is, the left-hand side mirror images the right-hand side, that means half of the 68% is here, which is 34%, and half of the 68% is here, the other 34%. So good, we've got some refinements already written on our curve. Since 95% is within two standard deviations of the mean, and these areas have to add up to 95%, you'll see that there's 27% that should be split equally in these two areas. That leaves 13.5% here and 13.5% here. Forgot to write my 95. There we go. And since we have 99.7% within three standard deviations, then we can figure out that 2.35% goes here and 2.35% goes here. Now if there's 99.7% of observations within three standard deviations, there's only 0.3 of a percent outside three standard deviations. And again, half of that goes in the left side and half goes in the right side. So that leaves 0.15 of a percent down here and 0.15 of a percent up here. So hardly any observations are going to be below three standard deviations below the mean or above three standard deviations above the mean. This picture will not change for any question about the normal distribution. So you can either Recreate it by adding up your areas to make sure they add to your 68, 95, 99.7%. Or you can just memorize the values. The areas are always going to be 0 0.15, 2.35, 13.5, 34. And then the opposite direction on the other side, 34, 13.5, 2.35, and 0.15. So there's one thing that will change with each question, and we'll look at that now with an example. The Haynes study from 1976 to 1980 studied the heights of adults aged 18 to 24 and found that these heights follow a normal distribution. So 
this is your first tip-off that we'll be using the normal distribution to answer questions related to this. The women's distribution had a mean height of 65 inches and a standard deviation sigma of 2.5 inches. The men's height distribution had an average height of 70 inches and a standard deviation sigma of 2.8 inches. Find the proportion of men with heights less than 72.8 inches. Once we tell you that the men's heights follow a normal distribution and we give you the mean and the standard deviation, you can label your normal curve and get your answers. Now the first thing I'm going to do is label my areas. I've got 34% here and 34% here. I've got 13 and a half here. I've got 2.35 here and 2.35 there and 0.15 down here and 0.15 up here. So now we can label in the values that actually do change according to each question. So we need to put our mean and our standard deviations on this picture. Now we want to find the proportion in the men's height distribution. So we need to be looking with, at the mean for the men of 70 inches. The mean is zero standard deviations away from the mean, so it goes right at the center of the distribution. So 70 goes right below the zero. Now, to be one standard deviation above average in height, how tall would you be? Well, that's 2.8 inches taller than average. So it's 70 plus 2.8, so that's 72.8. So 72.8 goes under the 1 for standard deviations. To be two standard deviations above average, it's 70 inches plus 2 times 2.8. So it's 75.6 inches. And to be three standard deviations above average, we can just add another 2.8, and we get 78.4 inches. My goodness. I hope you can understand that. That says 78.4. Now we need to label what it means to be one standard deviation below average. And to be one standard deviation below average, we're 2.8 inches less than 70. So that's 70 minus 2.8, which is 67.2. And another 2.8 inches below that, if we subtract 2.8 from 67.2, is 64.4. And another 2.8 inches below that is 61.6. There we go. So now we can answer the question, what proportion of men have heights less than 72.8 inches? That's the same thing as asking how much area is to the left of 72.8 inches under my normal curve? That is the everything to the left of this darkened line that I just drew. So all I have to do is simply add up my areas that are to the left. So I have 34 plus 34 plus 13.5 plus 2.35 plus 0.15. And I'm getting that there's 84% to the left of 72.8 inches. So the proportion of men with heights less than 72 inches is 84%. Or if you want to write it in a decimal form, 0.84. So in that last example, we learned how to label a normal distribution with the areas label the specific mean and standard deviations according to the question, and then be able to answer questions about the probability of seeing observations that small or large in the normal distribution. 
We're also going to learn standard scores and then percentiles. First, standard scores. Observations expressed in terms of standard deviations above or below the mean are called standard scores. The standard score is the number of standard deviations above or below the mean at which an observation is located. If the observation is below the mean, the standard score will be negative. If it's above the mean, it's going to be positive. What is the standard score for a height of 75.6 inches from our example above? Well, 75.6 is written directly underneath the 2 on this picture. So it corresponds to two standard deviations above average. So the standard score is going to be 2. Now what are we going to do if we don't have a picture to get our standard score from? or if it's not on exactly 1 or 2. Well, we're going to need a formula to compute that. So we're going to have a formula to compute the standard score, which is the observation that you want to standardize minus the mean, and then divide that by the standard deviations. We're going to call that a z-score when we compute it under the normal distribution. And another way to write it without the words is put x in instead of the word observation, mu in, since that's our mean, and sigma in, the denominator, since that's our standard deviation. When we standardize a normal variable, then z has a standard normal distribution. The standard normal distribution is a very important distribution. That is, z is a normal variable, so it has a normal distribution, with a mean of 0, and a standard deviation of 1. So the standard normal distribution has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. That's another fact that you're going to want to put on a note card and know for our exam. So what do we do with these standard scores? Well, we can take things that were on different scales originally and make a direct comparison of them. For example, imagine that Jenny scored 600 on the verbal part of the SAT, and her friend Gerald took the ACT and scored a 21 on the verbal part. If SAT scores are normally distributed with mean 500 and standard deviation 100, and ACT scores are normally distributed with mean 18 and standard deviation 6, and assuming that both tests measure the same kind of ability, who did better? Well, since these are normally distributed, we can standardize their scores and put them on the same scale. So for Jenny, Her standard score is going to be her observation, so x minus mu over sigma, and her observation is 600, that was her score. The mean of the SAT score distribution is 500. We see that from the wording above. And the standard deviation of the SAT score distribution is 100. 600 minus 500 in the numerator is 100, divided by 100 is 1. So Jenny has a standard score of 1. Gerald has a standard score of, his score was 21, so his x is 21. The mean of the ACT distribution is 18, and the standard deviation of the ACT distribution is 6. So 21 minus 18 is 3, and 3 divided by 6 is a half. So Gerald scored a half. So who did better? Well, 1 is further to the right than a half. They both have positive z-scores, which means they both scored above average. However, Jenny scored a whole standard deviation above average, while Gerald only scored a half of a standard deviation above average. So Jenny did better since she scored a whole standard deviation above average. Now, 
We've handled standard scores. We've handled getting probabilities associated with the normal distribution. Now we're going to talk about percentiles. Percentiles are kind of the opposite of getting those probabilities associated with the normal distribution. Let's talk about the definition of a percentile first, and then when we do an example, you'll see how it's sort of the reverse of what we did earlier. The percentile refers to the proportion of a distribution below a given value. What do you want to be in when you do an educational test? Would you rather be in the first percentile or the 99th percentile? Of course you want to be in the 99th percentile. The 99th percentile means that 99% scored less than you did, and the other 1% did better than you. So the 10th percentile has 10% of the distribution below it, and 90% above it, and the 95th has 95% below it, and 5% above it. So in general, the cth percentile of a distribution is a value such that c percent lies below it, and the rest lies above it. So let's recall that the distribution of SAT math scores follows a normal distribution with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. We want to find the math score that is the approximate 98th percentile for this distribution. So once again, we're going to label our areas. And we remember that since there's 68% within one standard deviation, we're going to have 34 here and 34 here. There's 13 and a half on either side of that and our 2.35 and 0.15. Now usually I also tell you to go ahead and draw in your 68, 95, 99.7%. That's not going to help us on this question, but I think it's a good idea to put that in there. In the last picture we had in the notes, I didn't have room to write that underneath. So we may as well just go ahead and get started writing that now. Now we can label the part that's specific to this question, and that is the values in this SAT math score distribution. So first we want to plunk down our mean, and our mean is 500. The mean goes right here below the zero. What does it mean to have a score that's one standard deviation above average? Well, a standard deviation is 100. So if you're one standard deviation above average, then you scored a 600. Two standard deviations above average is a 700. And three standard deviations above is an 800. What does it mean to score one standard deviation below average? That would be a 400. Two standard deviations below is a 300 and three standard deviations below is a 200. So now we've got our score distribution labeled on our picture and we can answer the question. Now let's remind ourselves what a percentile is. That's a place of value in the distribution. So this is going to be a SAT math score such that 98% of other scores are below it. So we can just start adding up these areas from left to right. 0.15 plus 2.35 plus 13.5 plus 34 gets us up to a score of 500, right? Now, of course, those numbers add up to 50% because that's one half of our distribution, and it's our symmetric distribution. So the 50th percentile is a score of 500. If we add the 34 over here to the right, that gives us 84%. So 84% of scores are below a 600. So 600 is the 84th percentile. Now what happens if we add the 13 and a half? 84 plus 13 and a half is 97 and a half. So a score of 700 has 97 and a half percent of the distribution below it. So, 700 points is the 98th percentile. 
We say approximate because we can only find the 97 and a half percentile. I hope that helped. Good luck with your questions.